Uh, I've entitled this the climate and biodiversity crises, building sustainability and resilience for our rivers, which follows on quite conveniently from Dieter Helm's presentation, as well as some of the uh, points that Alan and Antje raised in their presentation. Next slide, please. You're all familiar with the climate crisis confronting us. Uh, average temperatures increasing in all seasons, warmer or hotter, drier summers, warmer, wetter winters, uh, intense heavy rainfall events increasing and sea levels rising. The long, hot, dry summer that we all experienced in 2018 is forecast to occur every other year by 2050 and uh, reduced frost and snowfall. Snowfall levels are forecast to reduce by 40 percent by 2080. Significant for us on the Spey because the River Spey is dependent upon Cairngorm snowmelt for its spring water. Scottish Government has set a target of achieving net zero by 2045 and aims to be 75 percent of the way there by 2030. Next slide, please. Running alongside this and very much a part of it is the accompanying biodiversity crises. And at times Atlantic salmon have been referred to as the canary of the environment. When there's a problem with salmon, there's a much bigger problem elsewhere. And the problem really is much bigger than just salmon. Nature Scott in a recent presentation to the Spay Board highlighted a 24% decline in average species abundance and overall a 49% of species have decreased in abundance with a 14% decline in their distribution. Next slide please. So what are we doing to try to address this? Well, just by way of introduction to the Spay Catchment Initiative, uh, this was established in 2010 really as a follow up to the 2003 Spay Catchment Management Plan, which was in initiated by my predecessor and was really a very bold vision 20 years ago as to how we might work in partnership to achieve shared objectives. Alan referred in his opening presentation to documents that gathered dust on bookshelves and I think this had probably become one of those and in 2009 I went to see an area manager at the then SNH and together we decided to recruit a project officer and actually start implementing the uh, the catchment management plan under the Spay catchment initiative and it's grown year on year uh, and now comprises all of the organizations shown there including three local authorities, SEPA, Nature Scott, RSPB, NFU Scotland, and we've got corporate bodies such as Diageo, who own 13 of the 52 distilleries we have around the catchment, and GFG Alliance, who own the top 12 miles of the Spey and operate the aluminium smelter in Fort William. It really has become, over the last decade, a highly successful public-private partnership and it's set to grow even further. Next slide, please. Since its inception, we've undertaken a plethora of projects around the catchment. We've reconnected side channels to the main stem of the river, opening up spawning grounds for adult fish, but also providing safe refuge for juvenile fish during spades. As many other organisations attending the conference uh, have also done, we've established riparian fencing along burns to prevent livestock from poaching the banks uh, and followed this up with riparian tree planting having provided water trucks for for livestock watering uh, as well next slide please last year we undertook a project on the delafieri burn which is pictured top right here um, which had been straightened or a section of it had been straightened for agricultural purposes at a time when the practice was, as many of you will know, to get the water off the land as quickly as possible. Uh, we breached and lowered the embankments, uh, low, breached them in two places and secured large wood structures, four metre length uh, sections of trees with root plates attached, 
to divert the water out through those breaches, but also provide additional habitat within the straightened section. Now, our electrofishing had indicated that before we did this project, there were reasonable population of salmon and sea trout uh, above and below this section, but really this part here was very denuded. And by breaching and lowering the embankments, we provided habitat for breeding and juvenile fish. We also enabled the burn to reconnect with its natural floodplain, slowing the flow and benefiting hugely the biodiversity and the ecology of the area as a whole. And pictured bottom right there showed the heavy rain that followed just after project implementation, which showed the breaches working as intended uh, and uh, creating uh, a wetland area that was used by a lot of nature. We're greatly indebted to the McAllen Distillery and the Kangles National Park Authority for providing the funds for us to do this. Next slide, please. What I really want to focus on, though, was the River Calder Restoration Project, because this was a step change in our project operation here on the Spey. And you can see a picture of the Upper Calder here, which I think many people in society, when they look at a scene like this today, would consider this to be normal. Uh, but in fact, it's very different from the landscape that would have in, existed perhaps a couple of hundred years ago before the highland clearances, which saw people taken off the land and replaced by sheep together with the exponential growth in deer populations and have created this uh, very unwooded upland glen. Next slide, please. The Calder is a major tributary of the Spey, and it's also part of our special area of conservation. But sadly, it had been shown through our electrofishing to be largely underperforming in productivity for both salmon, I should say salmon and trout, really since the 1990s. And this was attributed particularly to the relative uniformity of the channel geomorphology, together with the lack of riparian woodland, which would have existed in the past, and consequently a lack of woody material falling into the channel. And that's recognised very much as being an essential component of both the ecological and hydromorphological functioning of a river system. We had various areas of windblown trees in uh, copses adjacent to the riverbank, which were of no commercial value. It was going to take uh, cost more money to remove them and uh, and take them away than, than, than would have been uh, recouped from sale of the wood itself. And so the estates involved allowed us to pretty much help ourselves and to take some of these trees with root plates attached uh, and use them as in-river large wooded structures. Next slide, please. These large wood structures were then placed into the river uh, guided by our consultant Seebeck, who were tremendously helpful in advising uh, exactly where we should put them and at what angle. Uh, and we put in a total of 29 along a stretch of the river where they would have best effect and they were anchored into the banks and or, or the river bed. And uh, since putting them into place, the uh, gravel deposition around these uh, tree structures have enhanced spawning areas for salmon, as well as encouraging the river to spread out over a larger area. It's raised the, uh, the river bed and reconnected the river with its floodplain, slowing the flow and creating natural flood management for the town of Newton Moor just down below. Next slide, please. Uh, we followed this in 2021 uh, following a two year lead up to the project, the, uh, the large wood structures were placed in the river in the summer of 2020 and in late 2020 and early 21, uh, we uh, went about uh, planting 15 hectares of riparian woodland along three and a half kilometres of the river and its tributaries. As you all know, helping controlling the water temperature by providing shading. Uh, as well as providing natural flood management benefits, as I've said, allowing the uh, river to spread out, providing habitat for invertebrates, as well as sequestering carbon. 
And it's important to recognise that this was done in part of a comprehensive plan with the three estates involved uh, because we linked it into the, their broader forestry plans and the riparian corridors that we were creating linked in with the broader forestry planting and enabled us really to put together a project at the, which, which would generate landscape scale changes. We conducted not just tree planting, but also quite a lot of natural regeneration from local seed sources. And we went about installing uh, deer fencing over a total of 37 hectares, uh, straddling the river uh, with three enclosures. We hope in time that the deer fencing will, uh, will be removed. But we, within this, we, we employed water gates, uh, which were put in at significant expense, but allowed us to uh, create these uh, wooded enclosures, uh, but still facilitate deer movement across the river and around the estate, which was crucial to the sporting interests of the three estates involved. Next slide, please. We haven't stopped the project there. Uh, the uh, monitoring and evaluation is continuing. Our ongoing monitoring is continuing to look at the project with regular electrofishing. Uh, we're also conducting red counts each year. And I should point out that having put in the 29 large wood structures uh, in 2020, uh, spates that followed in the autumn saw the collation of gravel around the root plates, uh, which led to uh, 12 reds being counted up there uh, soon after the uh, the trees had been placed in the river uh, in places that reds had not been seen before, which was a tremendous uh, success in terms of uh, looking at just what this what this might accomplish in the future. We're carrying out macro invertebrate surveys over four sites and uh, Brian Shaw, before he moved to the nest, installed, installed two continuous temperature loggers, both upstream and downstream of the project reach. Uh, we'll also be conducting uh, aerial, visual and ground cover surveys, maintaining comprehensive photographic records of the, uh, of the river as it changes. And we've got volunteers conducting annual dipper surveys as well. We've gone to significant lengths to promote publicity and outreach of this project as well. We've installed interpretation signs because the area is particularly popular with walkers. Uh, we've produced reports which we've publicised on our websites and on social media. And we've also had a short film produced, which I'll come back to in a minute. NASCO are going to be holding their annual conference in Edinburgh in June of this year. And we're going to be taking their delegates up to the Calder to show them the project and really illustrate uh, the landscape scale changes that we have put in place, which will help ensure sustainability and resilience to climate change. Next slide, please. I'd like to move on to opportunities for the future because the climate and biodiversity crises confronting us all were really promoted and uh, made the public aware of these crises confronting us uh, by COP26 in Glasgow in October last year. And since then, uh, we've had quite uh, significant corporate organisations approaching us to ask us how we can help implement their sustainability strategies. The Catchment Initiative has developed what I think is an enviable reputation for successful project delivery and implementation. And these organisations are now asking us for our help uh, in, in putting in place their sustainability strategies and they want to pay us to do so. Now, opportunities exist for all of us within the network. Uh, district salmon boards and rivers trusts are well placed to help corporate bodies with these sustainability strategies. And I, I think our work is going to expand even further to take an even more holistic approach to catchment management in order to do this. By looking at this, I'm talking about increased tree planting, not just the riparian corridors that we've uh, created so far, but also expanding our work to include carbon sequestration and perhaps peatland restoration as well. All of these can be included in our habitat restoration work, 
not just here on the Spey, but elsewhere throughout Scotland. <coughs> Excuse me. All of the above will enhance our ability to make landscape scale change to our catchments and make them more sustainable and resilient to the climate and biodiversity crises confronting us all. Next slide, please. And I'd like to close by promoting the short film that we produced. We had it made by Scotland, the big picture. It's only four and a half minutes long, but you can see it on YouTube. It's at the web link there. But if you go on to YouTube and type in Calder Restoration 2020, it'll take you straight to it. It's only four and a half minutes, but it really is well worth watching and I would commend it to you all. We've also produced reports on these uh, projects which can be found on the Spay Catchment Initiative website and also the Spay Board's new website uh, at riverspay.org and you can find a lot more information there. Next slide, please. Thank you for your attention. With that, I'll hand back to the chairman and I'm happy to take any questions if there's time for them.